Hello, and thanks for tuning in. This is Giving and Gabbing, the podcast all about fundraising success, brought to you by GiveGab, where we make it incredibly easy for fundraising professionals to be great at their jobs. We have an extra special episode of Giving and Gabbing today as we meet with two incredible members of the fundraising community, Woodrow Rosenbaum and Aaron Goddard. Woodrow is the Chief Data Officer for Giving Tuesday. Known best as the Global Day of Generosity, Giving Tuesday takes place each year on the Tuesday following Thanksgiving. Giving Tuesday inspires hundreds of millions of people to give, collaborate, and celebrate generosity. Woodrow and his team are able to use the data compiled during this initiative in compelling ways to inform the public as well as the nonprofit sector about the constantly evolving fundraising landscape. Aaron Goddard is GiveGab's COO, VP of Tech, and co-founder. In his role at GiveGab, he manages the data collected through our giving platform and looks for trends among giving day performances, donor behaviors, and more. GiveGab has been proud to work with the Giving Tuesday team over the past few years with many of our Giving Day partners launching their events during this global day of philanthropy. GiveGab supported 94 Giving Days, raising a collective $20.7 million through the generosity of over 54,000 donors during the most recent Giving Tuesday on December 1st, 2020. We're thrilled to talk today with Woodrow and Aaron about the role that data plays in growing the Giving Tuesday movement, both within GiveGab and throughout the world. With that, let's jump right in with our first question for Woodrow. Could you speak to us more about your role at Giving Tuesday as the Chief Data Officer? Um, what is your primary objective in that role? Sure, I'm happy to and I'm happy to be here. It's good to reconnect with, uh, with your team and Aaron, good to see you. Um, and my role is to manage all of our various data um, uh, projects and, and research initiatives, which have become uh, quite varied, um, both within the US and around the world. Overall, our objectives are to understand generosity, how to motivate it, um, how generous behaviors influence each other, what, what the intersection and interaction is between pro-social and, and giving behaviors. Um, and what the impact of those behaviors are on, on communities and the organizations and causes within them. Thank you, Woodrow. Uh, the Giving Tuesday at Data Commons is the largest philanthropic data collaboration ever built and it identifies innovative practices that can help grow generosity throughout the world. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that initiative started and how it has since evolved and also how you work with GiveGab and other Giving Day platforms to gather this information? Sure. Um, our initiative didn't start out with the, the kind of very broad ambitions and mandate that, that it has today. It really started because Giving Tuesday is not a, not a typical giving day in that um, it's more of a platform for others to co-create and activate around giving and generosity. And so one of the challenges with that is it's really, it can be, it's challenging to measure. It, the the activity is not happening all in one place and therefore it's hard to capture all of the things that are going on. Um, obviously a lot of that has to do with just understanding what the donation behaviors are, but it goes well beyond that to all kinds of ways that people express and celebrate giving on that day. And so initially the, the work was centered around getting a benchmark. Like what can we understand about how Giving Tuesday itself is growing year over year? Um, and so we, when we approached platforms like GiveGab, it was really with that in mind. Can you give us just a sense of the volume over that 24 hour period? Um, so that was, that was our, our fairly modest goal at the beginning, which was challenging enough, right? To just try to capture enough of the marketplace on a single day to be able to see, not necessarily everything that was happening, but at least be able to watch the trajectory over the years. What's interesting is what that unlocked. So the first opportunity was with platforms like GiveGab that were able to give us really granular data was the opportunity to dig in deeper into what was happening on the day. So not just how much money was donated, but 
who's giving to what and where are those givers and where are the organizations that are receiving those funds and really to try to get a, a more fidelity on the action on the day. And that extended to things like volunteer behavior and advocacy and other things as well. That, that though also opened the door for where we are now, where we're not just looking at Giving Tuesday the day, although we certainly are and there's lots to learn, but wanting to understand more broadly, what are the various uh, trends in giving? What are the indicators of greater giving and how do we motivate more of it? And those data flows um, change, our needs are adjusted in order to accomplish some of those specific research objectives, but the, but the basic is the same. We look to platforms like GiveGab to, to give us the raw material we need to start answering those questions. Definitely, and that's so valuable, I think, because of just the scope of Giving Tuesday and how much data there is, we really are able to see those trends um, pretty reliably, which is, which is incredible. And I want to ask Aaron, um, on the flip side, how does providing data collected on our platform to the Giving Tuesday data commons actually benefit GiveGab? Well, I think, um... Jackie, as you probably know, one of our key values is we walk the walk, right? So I think being, uh, you know, good collaborators in the space is super important for us. Um, you know, I think it was 2016 was the first time that we really engaged uh, with the Giving Tuesday, um, you know, initiative and efforts. And uh, Woodrow uh, brought, I don't know, probably a dozen, if not a little bit more, uh, organizations that did significant giving on Giving Tuesday together, I believe in D DC. At, mm -hmm. at, and we all got in a room and I remember watching a presentation and one of the things that uh, really resonated with us was, you know, the, the old trend of, you know, giving as a percentage of uh, disposable income or GDP hasn't really moved. And one of the initiatives they were trying to tackle was moving that needle. And, you know, I think something really resonated with us around that because, you know, not only are we in it to support, uh, you know, organizations that are looking to uh, support their mission and their cause through gifts, um, but we're in it to support everyone that's kind of working towards these wider philanthropic goals. So I think that was one of the main reasons why it, it spurred us to, to get involved. But, you know, secondarily, you know, we had seen some trends with the larger sort of community-based giving events that we had done that we do year round, but also, you know, condensed around Giving Tuesday as well. And we'd started to notice some patterns and we knew that they were starting to notice some patterns. And we knew that the other people collaborating on the data front were starting to notice some patterns. So we thought, well, heck, why not? Let's all get our ideas together and, you know, collaborate on this. So I think it was really, really timely uh, for us to kind of get that uh, invite from Woodrow and his team and really get involved. And ultimately, I think, you know, what we want to do too is take some of these insights and translate it back into our product and make sure that we can really, um, you know, help accelerate that growth going forward. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I think Giving Tuesday is all about collaboration. So it's really cool that we get to be a part of that and share um, our stories of the generosity that happened on Giving Tuesday and have that be part of the overall story. So that's awesome. I have a question. I think, I'm just sorry. I just wanted to add, I think what Aaron really identified as something that's really critical is that if we're looking at this not from a scarcity mentality, but from the perspective of the the of finding that opportunity to, to lift the floor, we can only do that by collaborating and by having a full picture of our marketplace. And that's where that's where that opportunity lies. And, and some of that is very pragmatic. Just make sure we feed these insights back into the platforms that mediate so much of the giving experience. And that's going to be increasingly true, right? That people's giving is is mediated by some technological platform. And that's a great opportunity because it means we don't have to teach every nonprofit and every giver in the world the best practice. We can build it into product. And that's really part of our objective 
with this project is to make sure that the research that that we're doing and that we're supporting is is connected back to practice and our platform partners are the way we will close the loop on that. Thank you, Woodrow. That's a really good point. I have a question um, for both of you guys kind of touched on the importance of gathering and sharing this data. Um, but how does this also help the nonprofit sector when you're able to um, showcase all this information? Well, I'll follow up from what I was saying before. I mean, I think well, I know there's a big gap between research and practice in the sector. Um, so we, we know that practitioners are not accessing the academic research effectively. And we know that um, a lot of the academic research that's happening is not contextualized by the people who are actually deploying the, the interventions. So just closing that gap is, is, a, is gonna provide a big opportunity at, at more success. What we need though is we need to build it into product as we said, and we need to provide actionable insights, right? We need to distill what we're learning into those, those easy to follow uh, pragmatic um, guides that the sector can use to become, to get more fidelity on their decision-making, right? So that they're able to segment effectively and they're able to take actions and that they're doing all of that um, they're within their capacity, that it's not, right? We can't expect the entire sector to sort of ramp up their, their entire uh, digital um, and data capacity. Um, we need to be able to give them the the boost that they need to to be to start getting into it in a way that's accessible yeah for sure and you know i think one of the interesting things is that with the the breadth and the volume of data and the ability to look at the data in an anonymized fashion respecting the privacy of obviously everyone but like if you step back and you say you you, talk, you think about what Woodrow said about the the, the research put into practice. Um, the opportunity here is just a, a huge set of data across a bunch of diverse types of fundraising practices, processes, products. That I think, if for example, you know, one particular um, company might say, "Okay, I read a paper, and I'm going to apply this to this type of fundraising that we specialize in." Um, they're going to get sort of that narrow view on how it applies to that type of fundraising. And I think one of the unique things about Giving Tuesday is that you've got folks that are running singular individual campaigns focused on their cause. You've got folks like the partners we deal with that are running large community-based, uh, you know, giving days, essentially, that are, you know, in a region or for a cause that span, you know, in, in some cases across the US, but for cause focused and other cases are, you know, a particular city. And there's all these different flavors. It could be an event, you know, it could be just a regular crowdfunding campaign. There's all these different flavors. It could be a, a donation form on a landing page that they've set up on their website. And I think what you get is different uh, donor behaviors, different uh, behaviors from the nonprofit administrators and I think being able to bring that cross section of data from all these different viewpoints together to then be looked at is something that's very unique that can only kind of be done in this time frame where it's this condensed fundraising that's broadly happening around the world, but in so many different flavors. And I think that's one of the, the, the ways that I think it's, just, it's truly unique how the collaboration happens and the insights that you can gain from that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was one of the things we noticed doing Giving Tuesday now was dropping that intervention into the middle of the chaos in right. May of 2020 um, catalyzed a lot of stuff, gave us a lot of opportunity to, to test some things to think, see how the, those interventions were going to react. I mean, it com sometimes it just comes down to having lots of N in your sample and an opportunity to try a lot of stuff as well as connect a bunch of things that aren't always connected. I think that was part of what you're getting at there. And it's like, mm -hmm. we get to see, we get to see the, the holistic environment 
um, in a moment, whereas normally that signal would be spread out over a long, much longer period of time and really harder, much harder to get the signal out of the noise. Right. Nor could you get everybody to say, yeah, we'll give you, you know, anonymized data on this part random particular day out of the, you know, like it just right. wouldn't happen. Yeah. So I think, exactly. that, you know, the, the spirit of the effort really helps to bring it together as well. For sure. Absolutely. There's a uniqueness to this, to, to the global Giving Tuesday um, sort of concept that really helps us in that way. Um, and getting a little bit deeper into that engagement piece and the engagement strategies, um, how was your team, Woodrow, able to use data from Giving Tuesday 2019 and then Giving Tuesday now to guide engagement strategies for the most recent Giving Tuesday 2020? I guess there are a couple of learnings, um, perhaps none of it too surprising, but that really clearly emerged from what we were seeing. One is that um, there's an opportunity, at least probably a need uh, for more frequent engagement of supporters. And that doesn't necessarily equate to more asking, although I do think there's an opportunity for more asking, um, but really a, 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 an opportunity to change our approach to be a discourse about the impact that we're having on communities. Um, it was very interesting to see that prior to, Giving Tuesday, prior to Giving Tuesday now, the dominant theme in the conversation around Giving and Giving Tuesday was community, not donation. And yet we had a big donation result. And that rather than kind of uh, revert back to the usual Giving Tuesday zeitgeist, in, in the lead up to 2020, Giving Tuesday 2020 on December 1st had that same pattern where in the lead up, the conversation was predominantly about community. And that it's really important to understand that the donation results weren't extraordinary despite that. They were, just, they were extraordinary because of that because we were connecting people's wallets to what they cared about and that that we we've saw, we've seen a a change in so many trends in giving giving in 2020 giving in 2020 looked more like giving tuesday normally does more broad based more grassroots more democratized um more varied um and those are all the things that we've been saying look we think giving tuesday's success up till now is because it's tapping into those opportunities and 2020 pivoted the entire marketplace that way. And I think that what that tells us about our strategy for 2020 is we're gonna be engaging people about how they can give celebrating generosity in all of its forms every week of the year um, and calling on our partners to help us to, to change that, shift that discourse, because we may be looking at the biggest opportunity the nonprofit sector has seen in generations because of the way that people addressed the crises of 2020. Um, this is our opportunity to lose, right? T tapping, tapping into that is where we'll, we'll be able to chart a course, for, not just for recovery for the sector, but for, for a thriving social sector. So I totally agree, it, it, you know, for the, you know, the awful things that came out of 2020, 2020, I think is going to be looked at as a catalyst for digital fundraising for a number of different reasons. You know, I think uh, Woodrow's spot on, we, you know, we saw a lot of, um, of our partners who might have run it, uh, their events at different times throughout the year say, well, I'm going to give this a shot and I'm giving it a shot for, for good reason. You know, we need we have a relief fund, we have, you know, things are so thrown out of whack from our traditional fundraising schedule, we're going to give this a shot. And I think it did prove, you know, as Woodrow mentioned, that there is more capacity for folks to engage, there is more capacity for folks to uh, give. And I think, you know, coming out of 2020, we've seen a number of our partners say, well, you know, maybe there's additional things I can do throughout the year. Uh, we have a number of partners who, who um, 
you know, have uh, sort of year round sites that are up, but then they actually have different cause based uh, giving month long giving events um, throughout the year with curated lists of nonprofits that fit the cause. And so I think some folks are starting to rethink perhaps that's an approach that you can complement to say a bigger event that happens throughout the year. Um, and, you know, I think additionally, and I think this maybe gets to some more of the data, but you saw this huge shift of giving happen where folks that maybe have never given online prior, similar to folks that may be have never bought groceries online or ordered food online to have it delivered, that same trend followed through with uh, giving online, donating online. And, um, and I think that's, that's also one of the big things that we've seen this leap forward on uh, coming out of 2020. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, I, I think that highlights the fact that these, these single day or focused events have an enormous power that we can tap into and, and we have not yet seen that the full potential of that. There's lots of room to grow. Um, and that's not mutually exclusive of a more ongoing engagement with your supporters, right? Give them those catalyst moments, the set that urgency, and then continue to engage, give them a diversity of ways to support you, your causes, your community. That's where we're really going to be able to see a transformation of our, of traditional approaches and 2020 forced a lot of the sector into some new practice there. Yeah, it was incredible to see all the creative ways that um, different organizations came together for fundraising. I saw a virtual like road trip and virtual galas and everything like that. So it's just incredible to see that um, people really came together to give and that organizations um, really had to get out of their comfort zones and try different things. A lot of organizations also maybe had never really tried online giving or had never been a part of Giving Tuesday or Giving Tuesday now and gave it a chance this year. So that was really cool to see. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's also worth noting that the sector is under extraordinary pressure right now. The, you know, you talk, I was in a meeting today with food security organizations that are talking about 500% increases in demand, right? Like that were stretched very, and, and at the same time, you know, can't have volunteers in the warehouse and half their, uh, half their workforce is in quarantine, like major disruptions to their ability to meet that increased demand. And we also on the fundraising side, we saw, I mean, we don't have final 2020 numbers yet across the year. We, we are uh, collaborating with the Fundraising Effectiveness Project on those reports and creating dashboards out of the data. It looks pretty clear like 2020 is going to be a pretty stellar year overall, but it was not a rising tide lifting all boats. There are winners and losers in 2020, and it's not just about which sector you were in. Uh, size seems to be a factor, but I think we're really what, because that's because some business models don't pivot as easily, right? And if you are very reliant on big events like in-person events or uh, in-person fundraising, um, earned revenue, right? Like you could have all the will in the world, but you might not be able to, and you may be pivoted, right? But your ability to ramp up something very different in a short period of time really dictated a lot of what those organizations were just able to, to achieve that agility and that diversity, we really need to build that into uh, the infrastructure. If we're gonna have a resilient sector, we need more diversity going forward. Um, and we need a willingness. I mean, the, the other thing is that despite a really strong overall result, we did hear from organizations saying they were worried that, about asking, right? This people won't be, they won't be able to give because they'll be worried about their finances or it's, or it's not a good time to ask because it's just, it's not sensitive. And the thing that we need to understand is that that mentality within the sector really need, I do think it's changing, but it still is, is a little too pervasive. We, we should be thinking about our relationship with supporters, first of all, is giving them the opportunity to express their fundamental human need to give. And what we see very clearly from our research is that people respond to the things they care about and the change they want to see 
with support of the organizations and the causes and the communities that are going to help them achieve that. That's how they get agency over those things. It is important not just to make it about money, but money is one of the ways that people will respond. And so we don't, it should not be transactional. It should not, it should be, you should see yourself as in partnership with people on, on solving those problems. And, and that means a lot of different things. That means, Yes, supporting the food bank because of that immediate need. It means supporting health organizations because of the health crisis. It also means the arts organization in your community because people are really thinking about who is in my community and 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 what do I what do I want to see within that? Who do I want to see survive in my community? You know, one of the things we heard um, and and saw from from some players who are in this space in 2020 was things like donating money to small businesses. Right now, that's not going to compared to donations to disaster relief. That's going to be a really a tiny, tiny sliver. But that wasn't even a category in 2019, right? Like you didn't have thousands of people getting together to give money to the local florists in 2019. That just wasn't a thing. And it really speaks to how people are thinking about how, what they need in their communities and how to support everybody within that community and organizations that think that they're intrusive are not thinking about themselves as part of that community healing. Right. Yeah, I really like that, Woodrow. That's a good point. I never thought before about giving to a small business and I do see those um, calls to action a lot more now and it does make you feel like you're really giving back to your community. Um, going back to a little bit about data, we talked about how uh, many of these nonprofits are pivoting um, to try new things or um, are just really looking for new ways to engage. And a lot of them are told that, uh, you know, follow the data, um, look at your data, but that can be a daunting task, especially for um, smaller nonprofits who might not know how to start. So how can nonprofits use their own data collected from Giving Tuesday, as well as the data provided from the data commons to strengthen their fundraising strategies? Aaron probably has a better answer to this than I do. <laughs> um, I mean, because I, and the reason I say that, I think part of, part of the answer to that is don't try to do it yourself. Right? <laughs> and, um, the, the, we can't expect every organization in the country to be able to kind of have a data science team. Um, and you can tell them to segment down to the individual donor all you want, but there's, you know, there's only a certain, they only have a certain capacity. Um, I think that, I think that what, the way we look at it is platforms are, are really the best opportunity to start synthesizing the organization level data down to actionable insights. What we wanna be able to provide is um, broad, broadly speaking best practices and trends and indicators to help inform those sector organizations to benchmark themselves and to help, as we said earlier, help platforms bake this into their product. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, it's really, I, th I think it's really important for any organization, regardless of the platform that they're using, to understand those, uh, you know, 30,000 foot broad strokes that Woodrow was talking about. Understand that, you know, you should consider, you know, leveraging peer to peer fundraising if you're not. Understand that you can really drive, um, you know, amplification of your giving if you're uh, establishing some matches and challenges beforehand understand that you know you can make uh, asks up to a certain amount before you know you expect a person to give um, understand the right times to engage with them those are those are all things that I think are at a high level have come out of this but I totally agree those are the things that need to get built into the platforms uh, as best practices so that when nonprofits, particularly ones who are sort of newbies at fundraising, um, particularly ones that are in small to, to, to medium size that maybe haven't, don't have necessarily the resources in house to really devise creative strategies. You know, that, that, that's where they should turn to, 
you know, the, the best product that they or set of products that really helped them guide them along that path. I think one of the interesting things was uh, I was looking at a recent uh, report uh, that came out of, I think it might've been the, it, the Blackboard Institute index or whatever. And it was saying as of it's September, so it's not complete to the end of the year, but it was showing, you know, small, medium and large organizations and large organizations, I think went up four and a half percent overall. And, you know, at that point and 7.5% online, but the smalls and mediums actually went down overall, but their online went up 20%. Yeah. And so I think there's some interesting things. I think they're heading in the right direction, at least of starting to leverage, um, you know, tools that can help guide them. I think that it, the tools aren't necessarily an indication that they've dropped overall, right? I think the, the indication is that, you know, the major gifts weren't necessarily out there for them this year or the, the, the galas and the events and the things that they've re relied on from a physical perspective to get their names out to create these um, sort of in-person uh, engagements weren't, weren't there. And so, you know, I think those are the things we have to look at as far as, you know, how, how do you guide um, organizations along and really help them leverage the insights that come out of this data is, is really, you know, finding the right tools to help them uh, implement those best practices. Yeah, and hopefully that that shift will mean new normal is doing both, right? And yeah. and and maintaining a more diverse exactly. supporter engagement and funding flow. Yep. Yeah, one of the big things that came out of what we saw with our Giving Day events this year was just people, you know, weeks before their events had, you know, had these physical live events happening and they had to do a complete, you know, switch and a lot went to live streaming and we saw some really cool stuff come out of live streaming so instead of a person you know going down to the main plaza in town and walking around and, and talking to the different nonprofits at the tables um you know the host was actually at the nonprofit organization you actually got a bit more of insight into what the nonprofit organization did and i hope and expect that that there will be a hybrid approach to that, that they'll still have sort of this live component, people going to the sites of the organization, still doing this day long, you know, live stream or um, in, in addition to mixing it up with in-person uh, physical events. And I think it, that sort of thing has the potential to really, um, I guess, heighten and drive awareness around what really is available in your community as a person who wants to engage, who wants to give you know, time, treasure, or talent in, to places within their community that they may just not know about. So I think, I, I think it was, it was interesting sort of, you know, pivot this past year, but I'm hopeful it will stay along with all the other traditional stuff they used to do as well. Yeah. I think that's the opportunity for the win, right? That there are, there are strengths and weaknesses in, in every engagement and, and, but they also support each other, right? They, different modes of engagement tend to support each other. When we looked at Giving Tuesday now looked a lot like a normal Giving Tuesday, but there were a couple of key differences. One was the incidence of volunteer behavior, which is not surprising. There were a lot less volunteer opportunities. First of all, people didn't have as much time to put it together. Secondly, people were in lockdown, right? So um, th what's interesting is that I think that suppressed only very slightly, but had a measurable suppressing effect on monetary giving, right? We would have seen more dollars if there'd been more volunteer opportunities. Um, so that, you know, this, this speaks to the, the big opportunity now to do exactly what Aaron's talking about, right? Like take advantage of the reach and, and the ease of digital and, and then re-engage um, in person and have the two intersect and support each other. It's, I mean, it's what we did in commercial marketing when we had face-to-face -face and it works. <laughs> yeah, I think those are some solid predictions for the future that the hybrid approach uh, definitely makes sense, I think, for where we're going. And there were a lot of great nuggets in there of advice for maybe some of those nonprofits that haven't uh, really taken the dive into data-driven approaches to how to how to improve their fundraising. And so speaking more broadly about digital fundraising, 
uh, where do you where do you envision it going over the next 10 or so years and how do you see data science having an impact on the sector as a whole? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I hope I'm surprised. Um, you know, th there's there's trends that we're seeing and we've discussed so far, right? We're going to see more adoption of these tools. We'll see more use of them, but that'll mean more and easier data flows. So we'll get more insight into optimizing them. And that's great. Like, I think there is uh, lots, there's clearly lots of room to optimize that entire um, economy. And I, I predict we'll do that, right? We will get more we will then therefore know more and we'll be able to feed that back into the system. What I find, I think, more, more interesting to think about is, um, well, perhaps more exciting is we, we had this, this, this enormous disruption, right? This shock to the system. And, um, and it changed people's behaviors very broadly in lots and lots of ways. And so what I want to what I think we want to understand over the next, over the coming months is what are the opportunities for systems change beyond just these tools that we're using in the data flows and the optimization where we can break through those, those metrics that Aaron talked about earlier, right? Not get out of that 2% of GDP to really see a, a new culture of giving around the world. And I think we have been presented with that opportunity. Totally agree. <laughs> you know, I think one one area that just needs a lot of work um, in general, from a, an even kind of systems perspective, is you know people give, and and you kind of touched on it earlier, is the thought that giving is a a transaction, and then it's done, and then maybe it happens again in six months or a year, whether it's a volunteering thing or you know giving a donation. Um, I just think there's so much room in the space for improving uh, the the post giving engagement, the stewardship aspect of it. I just it feels that there's not been a ton of uh, innovation or even just disruption from a stewardship perspective, and and I feel like if there could be, it's it's this constant cycle of engagement between the beneficiary of the gift, whatever the gift is, and the giver. And clearly, as you mentioned, there's an emotional aspect to it. There is obviously an outcome to the giving that is special. It's helping someone or something or some cause. And being able to, yeah, move it from being this transactional thing to an ongoing continuous relationship. I think there's just a lot of room for improvement on that. And I think that's one of the ways you really kind of move that needle. Um, be, you know, make it as regular as you needing to go to the gas station or the grocery store, right? Like, it, it, you know, I can't say that I get an emotional excitement from going to the grocery store every week, right? I mean, maybe some people, you know, <laughs> well, I, I mean, think that's, you can that's get the there. Way yeah, I mean, look, right. I, my, I come from a commercial marketing background, right? Whereas the entire job was to try to deliver some kind of emotional payload for going to the grocery store. And, and it's hard, right? But the nonprofit sector has that emotional payoff like built in. Right. And, and I think that part of the challenge is that stewardship became transactional as well. And, um, and that feeding that having a system for that is important. Being able to optimize is important, but if the result of that is you kind of leave the relationship behind, then we end up in this, in this cycle of just, you know, ask, report, rinse, repeat, instead right. of what you just described, right? A dialogue and a relationship. Yep. Before we close, I would like to again, thank Woodrow and Aaron for sharing their insights with us all today. I'm already counting down the days for Giving Tuesday 2021. Um, if you're looking for more tools like this to take your digital fundraising to the next level, visit our resource library to stay up to date with our podcast, webinars, downloadable content, and more at info.givegab.com resources. All right. Thank you, everyone.
yeah this is thank really you guys really thank awesome. you this was great appreciate it thanks yeah, Woodrow. Awesome. really appreciate the, yeah. the time on this yeah. so always love chatting with you Aaron.